Hi everybody, thank you for being with me today. I have with me Madeline Wallen. She is a woman with a large family, both the one she grew up in and her own consisting of her husband, five children and a dog. Since 2000, Madeline Wallen has been involved in issues about motherhood, children and family issues. Because of her own experiences and the power that has grown inside her until today. She is a board member of HARO, a Swedish national organization to empower, support, and strengthen stay at home parents and share knowledge about the needs of children. And is the general secretary of FEFA, the European Federation of Parents and Carers at Home. Hi, Madeline. Thank you so much for being with us today. It is a pleasure. <laughs> Hi, Susanna. I Very would great. like to start by asking you, what is HADO and how did you get interested, so interested in this topic? Oh, do you want a long answer or a very short? <laughs> it's Whatever a long you want to give us. <laughs> because it's a long story, it's not a very long story, but I, 20 years ago, I, um, I was expecting my fourth child, my only daughter, actually, and um, I, I had a feeling that I, our family wasn't in harmony. We, uh, it was a bit of a chaos. Our, our home wasn't more than a meeting point or it was more a house than a home. I, I was working part-time, leaving three children to daycare and to after school care. And uh, I realized that it didn't work. So our family didn't work because there was no one present. So I decided to quit my job, stay at home. And uh, it was my decision from my heart. So I told my husband and he said, no, 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 you can't do that. People don't do that. We can't afford it. And I was like, oh, if we will survive as a family, if we want to have a strong family, I have to do this. We, have, we will manage. So I did it, and um, he, both of us, think it's one of the best choices we ever made. But <clears throat> something uh, was, it was like the true, or like a mother power woke up in me. And since then I have really been fighting for this and I have been quite angry that this natural feeling, natural uh, urge to to care for your own children and to build a strong family, to build a strong society actually, that we are not supposed to do that and that society made me feel, uh, the society really cheated me I, I would say and I was upset that I didn't see that because I think I am, I am quite aware of my choices and what I do, and I am a thinker. But I, I did what I was supposed to do, and it wasn't. It was so bad for me, mm. <laughs> and for all of my family, and for I don't know. So then I found Haro at that time, and where I live in the countryside. And quite close to Gothenburg, there were we were so many women who did the same thing, who stayed at home, and who were quite angry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we created um, a network, and then we we found this organization that that is a voice for for parents who stay at home, and we all got engaged. We did so many things and we had so many meetings with our children and we became this empowered women. We, we really strengthened one another. And um, I see many of these women today, they are, all of us are working women. So it's not like you stay at home forever and you are, um, you, you become stronger, I think. If it's your choice. So then I, I started to work in Haro and I have been doing that for well 
like almost 20 years now. What do you think was the major change when you made that conscious choice of not being part of the working environment and being more part of your family environment? What do you think that it changed for you? For me, it was such a freedom. I, it was like I was, I made myself free from expectations, uh, norms. I, I really empowered myself in this choice, you know, to follow your, your heart and your instincts and your uh, eager to, to achieve and to, you know, to, I, I wanted to support my children. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be close to my children. And it's like, I, I wanted it all the time. And even though I didn't make the choice at first, or I worked part-time, but it has been the most empowering thing I have been doing. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I, from that time, I am more, I don't trust anything. There is nothing that is really the truth. I am, you know, I'm looking at things from different point of views all the time, mm -hmm. but I have my own stability inside of me I know what is right and true for me so it's I think it's easier it has been easier to to lead my life from mm -hmm. that time mm -hmm. so what is the work that Haro does is it about creating awareness of the importance of the parents that stay at home but you also talked about the needs of children because when they are at daycare, they are not with their parents. They are actually being educated by others. So what is the work that Hara does to create that awareness? And um, what are the goals, the highlights that you would like to say about it? First, first of all, I, um, we are really trying to be this, a support to parents who choose to stay at home because it's... Um, the norm is so strong not to do it. The, the norm is really, you have to work full time. You have to leave your children to, to preschool because it's better for them. We have so many things that are, we're being told and it's not, it's not true. Um, so we are trying to make parents conscious, but it's difficult to reach parents who are in the system. Um, so we are, we know that these, these parents who choose, mainly women who choose to stay at home, they are quite vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And the few ones who, who make the choice, they need, they often need support. But anyway, these are the strong ones, mm -hmm. but you doubt yourself because everyone is making a different choice. So I have been questioning my choice so many times, even though I know it's true, but because everyone else is doing something different, it's like, maybe it's, maybe it's me. Maybe I'm not, yeah. I'm on the wrong path. Maybe there, it's is, me. there is that pressure from society. Yeah. Yeah. And another thing also from my own experience that I see is that moms that make that conscious choice, even to work less and just stay more present with their children, if there's any problem with their children, even societal see, you stayed at home, yeah. look what happened. Yeah, right? exactly. <laughs> yeah. So we are, we have been, we are trying to spread knowledge about in, the importance to, to attach to your child during the first year so we have been in contact with and we have been more uh, focusing on the needs of children because this is really we don't stay at home because we just want to stay at home and uh, cook and uh, clean the house we stay at home because we have small children children that are in need of care and attachment and support and role models and someone who is close to them I lost my 
my thought. Do you want to talk a little bit? There was a conference that you gave where you explained how the caregiver system started in the first place because it was not the norm. It was actually not the norm to put your children in a, a care center from a very young age. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Because I think it's so important to understand in terms of history, how did it came? Well, no, it wasn't, it wasn't even the norm. When I was, when I was a child, mm -hmm. it was really the opposite. I remember women who stayed at home in my, uh, where I lived, they were questioning the women who worked. How can they leave the children? This is crazy. That's bad for them. Uh, so it's, that was really the opposite. And that was in the 70s. And uh, even when I had my first child uh, in 89, it was, it was easier. And the daycare, and it was called, it wasn't in the educational system. It wasn't preschool and it was, it was daycare. So it was mo most, uh, more about care. And we, it started because women were supposed to work and and to have to have care for the children not the education the education has become more it's like the almost like the commun, communist system mm -hmm. they use the same words to make women leave the children mm -hmm. that it's that professionals do it better and um, and uh, children need education, so it's. I I really don't understand when. Because at the beginning, and uh, Alva Myrdal, she she had, she she wanted to support women who who really couldn't, who couldn't, um, who had to work. So it, it's, it's both good and bad because we need a care system. I, I agree on that, really. We have to have that because, because we, we, we have to work. We have to. But suddenly we stopped having the choice of being able to take care of our children at home and even being considered that as a working force. Yeah. Because whoever ever had a child know that that was the most demanding job that oh, you yeah. ever, yeah. ever have in your life. And when you are having children and working, you're not having just one job, you're actually having two. But there are even, you know, lots of posts on Facebook, which I, I think are marvelous, when they talk about the different tasks and roles of a woman, and they say, you know, you are a nurse and you are a mother and then you are a daughter and you are this, you know, and, and then you yeah. take care of the house and then you cook, you know, and all of that. It's a lot of it's a lot of work. What what once in the beginning was supposed to be, you know, a help and it is a help. Suddenly it started to be a little bit out of hand because even now workers, I say for Portugal, you know, after four months, you can put your baby on, on the care system and you go to work full time. Uh, here in Norway, it's after a full year. So uh, what for me was to, you know, to give my baby away for a month and then I came here, it was after a year. I understood, what was I doing? What was I doing? My baby needs me, needs, needs yeah. this connection with me. Yeah. And then there's another theory which I found, you know, with interviews that I made, which I found was very interesting. When women start being a working force, they also start being more consumers. Because mm -hmm. if you're not at home and if you don't provide, you know, there's meals. This, this can be, you know, a woman that stays home or a man that stays at home, you know. Mm -hmm. So you, you don't cook, you don't provide meals, you don't have time. And then suddenly you consume more. You go yeah. more shopping, you go more this, because yeah. that's what you need to have at home. And that's what your, your kids are also, uh, are also uh, used to, because on, you know, on daycare, they have everything there and it's prepared and it's immediately, so let's go for it. So I think that there, is, uh, there was a balance that in the beginning was supposed to exist 
and then suddenly got as a norm as a rule and for me got a little bit out of hand yeah and this, is, this is it's all about economic growth it's yeah. about economic growth it's about gdp that we have to always improve and improve and consume more and more and it's all about production and it's never about reproduction it's like one thing is valued and the most important thing the reproduction and the human development it's it's not valued and we we don't how can we not how can we not care for the the growing environment or the the babies and the motherhood and this this crucial time and very sensitive time in a human yeah. development and the that brain helps brain. baby to build up self-esteem social mm -hmm. skills emotional intelligence even when we are staying more at home we recycle more you know if mm -hmm. there's furniture if there's this and then suddenly we start not consuming so much so there is a whole new production i i think that you know women it's wonderful to work i work i like i like mm -hmm. really yeah. a lot of, of what i do but um there should be there should be you know as a system a society and um, an understanding of the importance of both ways or even to achieve that balance in in our lives i know that you are also part of fefa you know the european federation for parents and carers at home so what do you think that needs to be changed in a way that we see the role of women and mothers in in today's society what is what is FEFAP doing? Well, FEFAP is, is trying to make a value to make um, to recognize and um, make the unpaid caregiving work visible, and uh, like in the European statistics, uh, if you are a, if you are a, let's say a mother of five children and you stay at home and care for them. In the statistics, you are you are called or you are mentioned as an in inactive person. <laughs> it's so it's so. Oh, I, I don't know what to say about that. Yeah. You know, you you never work. You are more active than ever. Ever. You cannot be more active. You have to be so alert. You have to be so present. You yeah. you don't have any vacation. You don't have any free time at all you are you have to be present 24 hours a day yeah and then they call you inactive yeah. as if you are not um giving anything to society and yet you can you can be the one who really make these five human beings um uh, sane and well-being and loving human beings who wants to to make this place a a better place so it's uh, for me it's it's unbelievable that people choose these kind of words when they talk about the main and the most important work in the world yeah that is making me really furious yeah yeah and and also when we know that the European uh, Union, all the countries have decided to that that women should work full time, even mm -hmm. though they are mothers of small children. Everyone is supposed to work full time. This is like our goal: production and economic growth and higher GDP. And so that is why I think it's seventy five percent of all women that that is the goal that they should work in sweden we do it already but there are mm -hmm. some countries they are like behind mm -hmm. <laughs> inactive women mm -hmm. <laughs> who are like the cornerstone or the yeah the 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 main source or the stability in different societies anyway that's why we created the Barcelona targets. Mm -hmm. So children are supposed to be in preschools or in daycare. 
because the mothers have to work. So then we also have these numbers of, I think it's 33% of all the children and below three years of age, the European Union countries. And I'm not sure about the figure, the number, if it's 80, it's more than 80% of, of children above three until compulsory school age. So we force countries to make this happen. In Sweden, we already achieved that a long time ago, <clears throat> but in Finland, they haven't. And they are like, I think they are even below Hungary mm -hmm. in, in one of these um, year. Uh, but in Finland, they have the, they have the best um, outcome in, in school results they are we have more um, mental illness or psychological unhealth in sweden among children and youth so it's i'm not sure it's the right thing to do yeah yeah so we even have some statistics statistics that can support and if and if you know governments and societies would really take a look at it of how mm -hmm. the importance of connection and the and the beginning of human development is and i always fight for that uh, especially you know conception pregnancy it's a vital period to embrace that connection with your baby and then the first years are the continuation of, of all of that development that was built up mm -hmm. on pregnancy so everything that you're saying for me makes you know it just makes a lot of sense and i do understand that today you know taking time and giving time to your children you know requires you to be prepared to fight against the current you know to fight in society and in a lot of western countries that's what is happening and even sometimes you have to go against of your own thoughts as you were telling you women can get very vulnerable if they just think if they feel that they need to be there present for their children mm -hmm. at a young ages or throughout their development and taking time just to be with them they sometimes they fight against themselves yeah what do you want to talk about about that because i'm sure that you have already found some women that uh, would say yeah i thought about that but then yeah 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 but we see, we see so many women that are you know they they leave their own children and then they work with very often taking care of someone else as i did when i worked i worked taking care of one one person and leaving my three children so it's i got um how do you say the word burnt out mm -hmm. yes. burnt out <laughs> for for several months i had i had to just to quit because it was too much for me and we are we are strong but it's 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 not a strength to to have to choose between caring for for your children and and doing a, a job because it's it makes you will you will think about if you are with your, with your children you think you have to be at work and the contrary you always you always have a lot of things to do when you have small children because mm -hmm. it's it it's time consuming yeah. and you have to do it you have to be there to build a relationship you have to be present you cannot be somewhere else mm -hmm. because then you you won't build it and and if you only have this short time to to make this connection and to create this attachment, I think it will do something to you and you will get sick by it mm -hmm. in different ways. Your body will react even though you, you try to control this, this way of doing things. You can control it, but it's, it will have an effect inside of you. Mm -hmm. There is uh, definitely uh, situations of stress and pressure that a lot of women went through, especially in their pregnancy, oh, yeah. in their working field. Uh, yeah. People know that they are pregnant if, if the, the work team does not support or they do, but they don't. 
Yeah. Uh, and I see a lot of women uh, dealing with uh, with stress and pressure throughout pregnancy. That's also the work that I do with them to help them to alleviate, to release some of that mm -hmm. tension and be able to go through and follow their instincts and their own intuition. Because we're also talking about our own biology. Yeah. We are equal in terms of rights, you know, and opportunities and all of that, but we are definitely different from men and that's yeah. our biology. And there's yeah. also that nurturing uh, need, that harmony need inside of ourselves. So a lot of women, they got stressed, not because of their work environment, but because they are fighting against yeah. themselves. Yeah, exactly. So as you were talking about, you know, then they get seized and, you know, in the long run, may, it may not be exactly on that time, but then in the long run, some things happen and they don't know why. Um, and it is because they have been years and years fighting against themselves because we feel it in the end. When you talked about, you know, there was such a strong will for you to do this, this work. Uh, that's what I, that's what I, I learned. And what I felt for myself and I feel in all women that I work with is that there is this strong transformational force in each pregnancy that we have, in each baby that we have. And then we have the choice to, you know, to move forward and, you know, engage on that power and do things if that's what we want to do. Or we also have the choice of, you know, going back and just, you know, allowing things be as they are. And, you know, just continue with the past that we were doing before pregnancy. The pregnancy mm -hmm. is such a transformation mm -hmm. hormonally, but also emotionally, mentally mm -hmm. to a woman that no doubt that the woman, if the woman is sensitive enough, she will feel that she is in touch with that power. Don't you mm -hmm. think? Yeah, definitely. What do you think that needs to change in society? What would be the society where you would like to see for instance for your girl for your baby girl you know and uh, what would you like her to have the opportunity to feel when it was her time to have her own children and her i would love to have um, a society where we where we see mothers as role models and as motherhood as something that empowers you because it really does it it is the most empowering um, journey journey yes it's like it's like you have to leave yourself somehow and that is that is really a way to connect to yourself in a new and a better way because you when you have a child, you the child is more important than you. Mm -hmm. Even though you are the most important person to the child. So it's like your ego is taken away. That is, I think, that is what happens. Your ego is lost. Because we are, we, we really live in a society where the ego is so present everywhere. We are supposed to be like a brand or uh, like a, an individualistic, um, I don't know, like you are on your own, but we are never on our own. We are a part of a community, a part of relationships attached to people, dependent on, on, on others we will always be dependent on someone sometime during our life and to take away this ego just want when you want to do things for others that is isn't that almost the purpose of life mm -hmm. to make life better for others and then to yourself as well so for my for my daughter i really hope that we will have a society that sees this um, the first years in life as like a precious plant that you have to care for you have to nurture it give it enough water and enough sunshine and enough 
of everything and to protect it really because if you if you give this plant to someone else who doesn't love your child who doesn't leave their ego to care for your child it will not be this magical um, upbringing i want i really want children to have a childhood that is uh, that you have a feeling of magic mm -hmm. because it's like I don't create my child or her dreams or his dreams or their dreams they do it themselves I am just there as a protector as a as one that they can come to and go you know to be like a tramp trampoline do you say that mm -hmm. yes or a base they attach to you and then they go away and the smaller they are they have to be more attached and then they go further and further away and i have a son who is 30 now and he you know i i know when he needs me he doesn't he is really independent he has been uh, very he was independent very very early on <laughs> so i have never been worried about him taking care of himself i he he can do he can manage anything but you know sometimes he comes back to me mm -hmm. and i really know that okay we need a connection mm -hmm. and i have the same with my mother i okay i need my mother now mm -hmm. <laughs> and especially when you are sick or something you have to oh please see me please just say something mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that we, I don't know how, it's not difficult because, because it, it wouldn't cost so much. Mm -hmm. it, actually, it would cost less if we gave support to this vulnerable time and made people aware of the importance of it and support the ones who, who doesn't have this natural, because you don't have it in natural if, if you haven't had it yourself. Mm -hmm. If you haven't been, had this, um, primary caregiver who loves you mm -hmm. you don't know how to do it and this this circle of of uh, attachment it has to be if it's it's if it's uh, broken we have to we other other people have to heal it and i think the best thing for that to happen would be if we have relatives or people who are really very close to you but we have to do that because these cycles are so easy to break and so difficult to heal because it's like these first years of life, they are, they are so strong imprinted in us. Mm -hmm. So we have to care for that. And also in today's society where, you know, as you talked about, you know, marketing and publicity and, you know, all of these objects and the telephone and all of that. I'm not saying that technology is bad. I think technology is good, you know, being used in a good way. But there are so many factors that can influence you to become detached by your own kids. You know, even, you know, I am a stay-at-home mom, but I'm constantly on the phone. Yeah. Where am I present in the life of my kids? Because they don't see the connection. It's suddenly there's something there that interrupts the connection that exists between both of them. So there's a lot of issues that uh, you know need to be addressed when we talk about families. And because we have been you know focusing a lot on the role of women, what do you think are the role of men in all of this? I know that I've read some articles that even in in Sweden, you know, now there's a lot of men that are taking the time just be with their with their babies what do you think are the role of men's also you know in all of this as part of the, of the family yeah i think it's uh i think i think men in sweden are really very um they are very nice mm -hmm. and um uh, eager to most of them at least <laughs> mm -hmm. but eager to care for their families and to do the best actually i i see women as stronger uh, but at the same time we need men who are who really can understand that women are not strong all the time mm -hmm. we have a strength that is really um 
I, I don't know, but we are pushing things forward in a different way. Uh, and at the same time, I think men and women are quite detached from one another at this moment. It's, it's difficult to say, but for me, it's, it's um, especially, especially during pregnancy and uh, the early years and the first, uh, especially the after you have got your child, you are, you are really vulnerable uh, as a new mother. And at that time, I think the father's role is crucial to, to care for this, this environment, to protect that environment. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, so you, you, can, you know that you can be in this um, vulnerable time and just relax, uh, that you have someone who is taking care of you. Because I think men and women are a bit like yin and yang but we are not always yin mm -hmm. not always yang mm -hmm. because we have to we have to change roles sometimes uh, i am vulnerable and my husband too has, has he has to be the strong one and we have to shift that from time to time so i think actually i think the only thing that is different really is that we are giving birth and that we are closer especially from the start we have a different bond to our children mm -hmm. and we have to share that to to uh, the men but in order to do that we have to be the vulnerable ones we have to be really uh, this, it's very difficult to explain what I think yeah. about. I have uh, there's there's uh, an important doctor Michael Odant. He's, uh, oh, yeah. he's I have met him. Yeah, it's yeah. great. And um, he ha I think he had a wonderful way to to talk about it when he says that a man uh, understands uh, maternity and motherhood through the experience of a woman. Yeah, the woman is the one that introduces exactly motherhood. Yeah. to the father yeah. and um, and the man loves even more her wom his woman and his child because of the love the maternal love mm. of yeah. a woman and i think that sometimes um as you said mother uh, you know as you said women and men can be so detached from each other that suddenly in a pregnancy in a couple the mother that is with her baby inside is having a totally different experience from that man yeah and we know that uh, uh, a lot of couples they split on the first year of of when the baby is born yeah. and i do see signals of that that's why for me it's so important that conception and pregnancy be lived as a team yeah. So that the man, when you say a man is eager to, you know, to protect, to nurture, you know, that it's also a choice. And men have to step forward and say, you know, it is my choice. I also want to be pregnant. Yeah. I want to be pregnant with my wife. And then that shift that you told, you know, sometimes I'm vulnerable, then he's strong, and then we shift, and then it's the opposite. That happened, and it's just like a beautiful dance, like the dance of yeah, the universe, yeah. you know, just going yeah. it's like a flow. Uh, but when that doesn't happen, it seems like, you know, we are a family, so we are supposed to have a child. And the, the mother, because of the, all this hormonal change and the mental and all of that, she, she goes through it, and it's very natural. There's nothing that she can't do, but she will go through it. And um, and the man, if the man is not sensitive and and doesn't see what he's going to, he will probably find after pregnancy a whole different woman than what he has married to. That the one that he has married to, and sometimes that can be a bit of a shock. 
but not only a shock for a man because the woman also discovers a whole different man. So I think that if this journey is done together, they go to the other way out and they were both transformed. It was a beautiful thing that happened. It was magical. And suddenly the, the choices of a woman that says, you know, I want to con continue connected with my child. I just feel this so strong. The father feels exactly the same. And then it's the beauty of it, I think. It's the beauty, the, the beauty of walking the path yeah. together. Yeah. Tell me. And, and yeah, yeah, continue saying. Also to be patient about the time that things will always change. If we have this time when the mother really feels that she has to be so close to the child, let her be and just wait. You don't have to, you don't have to do everything at the same time and you don't have to be, don't push the relationship. Just see the building of um, the family and this group. It's really beautiful time. Yeah, it is. I think it's definitely like the best times in my life has been just you know after giving birth and this when you go inside and you have the meeting with this baby that has been living inside of you. It's so it's so amazing, <laughs> beautiful. Tell me what is the initiatives, the work that your organizations are doing? How do they do it? Do they, you know, they do workshops or they go to conferences? I know that you travel a lot. Tell me what you do. Well, what I do best is um, <clears throat> um, building networks and um, um, meeting people, sharing sharing um, the knowledge and uh, making people aware of the situation in Sweden because everyone thinks that it's paradise for everyone that you can do any choices at all. They don't know that children, young people and especially women or this, this group, they don't feel very good at this time. Uh, so we make awareness of that and um, after 20 years we have we have a lot of uh, um, contacts around the world and we also we arrange conferences we we also have small meetings actually on this kind of thing as zoom we have had uh, meetings uh, mothers to mothers uh, to have talks about as people feel quite vulnerable and uh, alone in this um, choice we have we have meetings mm -hmm. and it's like it's like people who are doing something bad and they confess that I am I choose to stay at home mm -hmm. so did I <laughs> it's like <laughs> <laughs> Can we talk about <laughs> yeah, it's, it's so it's insane really that we have to create this it's like starting natural things all over again that how can we for, how can we have forgotten how to just make this choice to stay <laughs> to care for your our own children it's crazy um but then we try, we try to have uh, contacts with politicians mm -hmm. and uh, journalists and, and a lot of contacts with uh, researchers, psychologists, you know, experts in different areas. So we have a very good contact in, in um, New York, Erika Commissar, mm -hmm. who, is, uh, who wrote the book Being There, Why Prioritizing Motherhood in the First Three Years Matters. And she's Oh, she's such a strong woman and she's really, um, she's really working with this and she has been in Sweden and is aware of uh, the situation. And then we have contact with the trauma experts mm -hmm. who also see that this is, this is, this will be a trauma when you leave your children at an early age, when they are not, um, 
uh, ready for that and you you uh, delegate the your responsibility there will be a trauma that will last we don't know for how long it will last but it's mm -hmm. this is like we are creating um traumatized society mm -hmm. and we are not even aware of that mm -hmm. so we are you know i have contact with uh, danish uh, stay-at-home mothers um, uh, Danish researchers, um, a woman who works with family and children issues in uh, on a very high level in, in Egypt. In um, I have been in contact with Marilyn Waring from New Zealand, who is a feminist, a lot of feminists, you know, so I, I think I would call myself a feminist, perhaps because I am. <laughs> I don't like to call myself things, but I think I am. And I'm very much, uh, um, I am very interested in, in uh, reading about and taking, um, and then know, try to understand what a feminist who, who, who doesn't want women to, to be with their children, how they think and how I really want to understand mm -hmm. how it how it comes that we are we are neglecting this, mm -hmm. and we, that that we are really. I go to the Commission on the Status of Women maybe for the thirteenth time next year, twelfth or thirteenth. I don't remember. Yeah, twentieth. No. No, um, uh, thir thirteenth, um, and every time it's we don't talk about it's it's we talk about the convention of uh, the rights of uh, women, uh, but we don't talk about motherhood. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's wh what? <laughs> yeah. How can we not talk about motherhood again? It's, we are addressing, and it is it is on the. On the highlights uh, of international organizations to talk about the rights of women but not the rights of motherhood so no, it yes. seems as if as if the rights of women were detached yeah. for what it is yeah. actually one of our main functions with is yeah. to yeah. build up the new generation yeah. to brought it yeah. <laughs> brought the, to light a new generation so it yeah. seems like that it is seen a lot as um as the role of a woman equals to a role of a man, but when it comes to motherhood, well, that we don't actually know what to say about it. No. So it definitely needs to be more addressed. That's why I, I so much wanted to interview you um, to talk about these issues because I think they are so important at least to make people think about, about it, uh, men and women. For some women, I'm sure that this will highlight them things that they were feeling, but uh, they were probably not aware or they don't know how to put them to words and I think you addressed it in such a spectacular way. Thank you so much for this wonderful interview. I'm going to put the links that of, of the people that you talked about and of the organizations that you are part of because I think there is even more information that people can get from it. And um, thank you so much for being for being with us today. It was It was great to know you and to know about everything that you do and how you think about things and about children. Thank you so much, Madeline. Thank you, thank you for having me. Thank you, Susanna.